And um, I want to invite you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. And uh, we're going to be talking about serving today. You know, so we have, you know, a, a few weeks here where we're really putting an emphasis on kind of getting ourselves in position, you know, for the things that are, that are coming. So let's um, put the verse up on the screen, Galatians 5, 13. And uh, can we read it out loud together? For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for the time that we've already shared together. And Lord, we just pray that your, your fingerprint would remain um, on the time that um, is ahead. And Father, we just kind of put ourselves into a position, Lord, where we're waiting on you. Lord, we're waiting uh, on you to hear. We're waiting on you to renew strength. We're waiting on you, Lord God, to reveal. And I just pray that these next moments would accomplish that for the glory of your name. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've just titled this message, um, Saying Yes to Serving. You know, it's consistent with the campaign that we're in and the things that we are, are wanting uh, to talk about. But I, I want to just kind of answer this question, you know, why should we say yes to a life of serving? You know, because a life of serving is a little out of the ordinary. It's a little unique in the sense that, you know, our, our, our culture is not necessarily beating the drum of serving others, but rather it makes very clear, you know, the motivation, you know, get all you can and do what is good and right for you and what feels good. And as we have this conversation about serving, it's really elevating our, our vision and our, our perspective. Uh, this verse in Galatians that we looked at provides two different insights for why we should say yes to serving. And the first one is this, we have been called to freedom or to liberty, your uh, translation might say. And the reason why this is a part of the conversation that ends with, uh, you know, serve one another in love is because Paul is recognizing that the freedom we have in Christ gives us a new perspective. See, we're not, we're not free to do whatever we want, but rather we have a perspective that, that our lives are to be contributing, our lives are to be a, a living sacrifice, as he says in the book of Romans, and that our lives, like the life of Jesus, is, are to be poured out according to his purpose and his call. And there is um, an understanding that, that we, are, we are free from the old life through salvation in Christ, but the freedom and the liberty that we have in Christ is not exclusively just a salvation thing, but rather it is something that gives us a new lifestyle and a new way of serving and living. And it is not only good for the spirit, but it is good for our emotions, it is good for um, our, 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 our mental faculties. And as doctors and scientists study this out, they're affirming the fact that what Paul is calling us to here today is good for the whole of who we are. And I want to share some of those things with you. Medical studies reveal this about serving. Serving reduces stress. Now, as we think about serving, it might induce stress, but as we serve, there is a, a reduction of stress that comes because the process is healthy and it establishes a good work within us. It not only gives us a new perspective like we see from our, our, our verse today, but, but it also increases our sense of community and belonging. And I really believe this is one of the values that we're going to see as we, we enter into this together. You know, at the end of the year when the, the, the prospects of another campus came to us and we were working through all of this, we laid out a timeline. And the timeline was, well, okay, if God's called us to do this, we've got to be, you know, good stewards of, 
uh, finance, you know, so that we can get the new campus ready for ministry. So we spent a lot of time on budget and having conversations and figuring out what it is that we need to do. And then coming right out of that now for April and even headed into May a little bit, we're saying we need to be mobilizing ourselves to serve because the time is now. We're coming out of a season where we've been told to shelter in and we're saying that now we're recognizing that we're in a moment where we need to learn how to serve and to give our lives again. And, and, and we're, we're, we're using this month as uh, that emphasis so that we can spend the next months to, to train and to equip and to get ready to do what we're going to be doing together in the fall. So an increased sense of community, an increased sense of belonging. It's not only you know, right for us in regards to to kind of the season that we're in, but it's right for us in regards to the, the reality that is a part of our community. You know, a lot of you are new to Rock Church. A lot of you have come within, you know, the last month or year and so on and so forth. And the way that you begin to feel a part of the body is you begin to serve with those who have gifts like you and who are saying yes, you know, to what it is God has wired and shaped you to do. Above and beyond community and belonging, there is a multiplied joy and gratitude that comes from serving. You know, the scientists tell us this. They say that for, for our, our, our emotion and ourselves mentally, as we learn to serve others, there is a, um, a multiplied sense of joy and gratitude that rises within us. You know, this um, reminds me of conversations that I used to have with teams that were coming to serve at Project 1013. You know, they would show up at the base camp and, and we would get them mobilized and get all of the liability waivers signed and all the work orders distributed. And then before they went to go do the work, they would come and talk to me. And I was the pep talk guy. I was the one that was going to tell them about the neighbor they were serving and tell them a little bit about the neighborhood they were in and, and the call of God that was behind all of the efforts that were taking place. And then as a part of that conversation, I, I would just say this consistently. You are going to go to bed tonight more tired than you've been in a long time. <laughs> um, you're going to sweat. You're going to bleed. You're going to be exhausted. But when you put your head on the pillow tonight, you're going to tell yourself, I have done something good. And, you know, just consistently, every day, there would be team leaders that would loop back around to me, and they would say, you know what, Pastor, you were right. Well, we found a patch of poison ivy, and I'm all itchy. And, or, 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 you know, we, uh, we turned something over, you know, in the neighborhood, and there was a covey of, of snakes, and we ran for the hills because we were afraid. And, and, yeah, we sweated, and, man, we're hungry, and we're exhausted. But, you know what, we were glad we were here. And you see, when, when the church operates under the, 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 the call and the mission of Christ, we find ourselves experiencing that regularly. We're, we're aligning our life in a way that doesn't make sense to the world. We're pouring ourselves out in a way that is uncommon in our culture. And there's um, a lot of, of extras involved in that. But when we say yes to Him, we know this joy and gratitude multiplies within us. And I'm I am just believing and praying for that to be our testimony in the days ahead. Deeper levels of joy and fulfillment being discovered as we serve together. But on a, on a more spiritual note for our soul, we say yes to these kinds of things because from the Scripture we understand this. A part of the Christian life recognizes that we serve God by serving others. You know, that, that there is the reality of what we can see in front of us, but there is also this spiritual dynamic that as we serve and give and pour ourselves out, we are doing it as unto the Lord, Jesus teaches us. You remember the occasions in the Scripture where he says, you know, you gave a, a cup of cold water, or you went and visited me when I was in prison, or you clothed me when I was naked, and they said, when did we do this, Lord? And he said, when you have done it, Unto the least of these, you have done that unto me. You know, and may the church, you know, just live that identity out in Christ, that we understand that as we serve, we serve the Lord himself. But then also from a, 
a spiritual perspective, we are the most like Jesus when we serve others. So we just came through Holy Week. Now one of the uh, days of Holy Week is Monday, Thursday. It's foot washing day. That's what the, the, the day is, is, is referring to. And that's the moment when Christ was with his disciples, and you remember, he went to go wash their feet, and they felt very awkward about that. Peter says, well, if this is the right thing, don't just wash my feet, but, but wash the whole of me. And at the end of that, he says this, I have given you an example, and you should do as I have done unto you. So the Christian life is one that follows the example that, that Christ has set, and it recognizes this, that servanthood or a servant's heart is a disposition of the heart and spirit that expresses itself in concrete action. In other words, the church is not just to talk about the things that Jesus talked about, but the church is to also do the things that Jesus did. And we are the most like Jesus when we serve others. We are um, no longer controlled by things that want to consume our time and and define us because Christ does. But let's just be honest with us. There is a mental battle that we have to push through as we are pursuing the call of God. You know, when we begin to feel those initial stirrings and those unctions in relation to, you know, how we connect into the grand scheme of things, there are oftentimes um, you know, mental challenges and hurdles that have to be overcome. And I, I want to talk about this because uh, not only has Christ made us free, but we have to learn how to walk in freedom daily. And I believe the battle that we go through mentally is one of the ways that that is expressed. Every day we have thoughts that, that want to entertain us. Every day we have thoughts that, that, that want to try to, to plant something contrary to what Christ wants to do. And working through that is a way of learning how to walk in freedom. So we've been set free so that we can walk in freedom. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we'll put it on the screen, and I want you to, to look at it. It's just one verse that is in a broader conversation, but it, it speaks to the necessity of, of how freedom in Christ changes the way that we think. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and then bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So mentally, we have to be bringing thoughts into obedience. We have to discern what God is saying, and then we have to track with it. We have to implement it. We have to embrace it. So you might be saying, well, what in the world is a stronghold? You know, we don't really use that. It's kind of a building term in many respects. You know, in the ancient world, strongholds were, were certain buildings that were, that were built for fortification and protection. And in this context, Paul is saying that, you know, there are things that can come into our thinking that want to create and establish a fortress that is not of God's kingdom. So a stronghold is a thought it is anything that rises up against the knowledge of God or the understanding of God, what God might want to do in us. And I had a, a friend this week, um, kind of, I felt very, very wisely and very clearly define oftentimes where these strongholds and how these strongholds try to get a foothold on our lives. And he said this, strongholds or thoughts that need to be taken captive, they oftentimes live in questions. They live in questions. Now, I'm not saying that we aren't a thinking people. I'm not saying that we aren't a people who can ask questions, but we need to also understand that our adversary, the devil, uses questions for his purposes. And it goes all the way back to the garden. Genesis 3.1 is as the serpent is having conversation with with Adam and Eve, he begins his strategy with a question. And he says this, has God indeed said? And then he begins to unravel and he begins to, to find his way into thought processes that you know, ultimately lead to sin entering the world. So here's the, the, the thing that we have to understand as believers. 
we can have more than one seed growing in the garden of our minds. Okay, gardening season is upon us, right? You know, you're going to plant tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and all of those things, but as the season comes underway and things begin to grow, you know, there's going to be more things growing there than you planted. And we can in general say it's like this. You know, there, there, there is seeds of faith that are growing in our garden, and there's seeds of unbelief that are growing in our garden. And oftentimes those seeds of unbelief are, are planted through questions. Did God really say? Is that really what God meant? Are you even able to do what you sense the Lord calling you to do? Living in questions, seeds of doubt, seeds of unbelief. And as I was just kind of processing this this week, it it, it brought me back to a moment about seven or eight years ago. And we were uh, just through our pastoral transition, um, just a lot going on in the church, lots of things that uh, you know, were, 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 were needing attention and energy and time. And then one day in my office, I, I, I get a phone call, and it's, it's Pastor Malone from St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church. And he said, Pastor Jared... He said, I would like to invite you to be a part of a men's conference that we're doing. He said, uh, Saturday on such and such a date, you know, we're going to have you know, multiple churches with us. It's a, it's a men's thing. And would you be one of our presenters? And, and as I'm saying yes on the phone because it's the right thing to do, in my mind I'm saying, do I have the time to do it and do I really even have the ability to do it? And then it got even more complicated when he gave me the assignment. He said, okay, I'm going to give you a book, and this is what I want you to present on. And at first I thought, this is good news. I don't have to figure out what to talk about. And then he said, the name of the book is you know, XYZ by Francis Schaeffer. And um, I don't remember the title, but you all know Francis Schaeffer, right? He's an intellect, very, very deep. I looked the book up, I began to read it, and I thought, how in the world am I going to talk about this for an hour in a way that the men are going to get it? This was like, you know, upper college level stuff. Well, God in his grace just kind of walked me through the process. We made the, 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 the presentation, it went very well. At the end of the day, Pastor Malone said, hey, thank you for doing that. I heard a lot of really good stuff from the guys. But then probably the more significant thing that happened is as I got in the car and started driving back home, I said to myself, I can do it. Not on my own, but obviously, but Christ in me. So do you see how in the, in the garden of our minds there are these, these, these conflicting and competing seeds you know, that want to um, plant themselves? On one hand... We, we, we're doing something because we know God has called us to do it. It's, it's something that is right to do. There's a, there's a benefit above and beyond ourselves. But then we're saying, but I know myself. I know my busyness. I know my schedule. I know my limitations. And we oftentimes review those realities and we disqualify ourselves. And Paul is saying, don't let the stronghold take root. You know, but rather take it captive and remove it. Because that is a part of walking in freedom in Christ. And here's the danger of when we don't learn how to make, um, take thoughts captive. See, when strongholds rule, we stay busy and not fruitful. And the world is filled with many ways that we can remain busy. I found a quote this week that I I, I thought was, was spot on. And this pastor said, busyness is artificial significance. Kind of makes you think of Mary and Martha, right? You know, one at the feet of Jesus, one serving and, and going, you know, kind of, kind of crazy trying to do what she felt she needed to do and oftentimes the Lord just looks at us and says you know what find your significance in me and in what I'm calling you to do 
expanded activities increase the cares that compete for God's word. So the Christian life, it produces a level of understanding that isn't gained through human reasoning. It's the mind of Christ. It's faith overcoming belief, unbelief. And we're going to take this journey together. In fact, I just believe that it's, it's, it's best figured out together. Because we learn from one another's stories and we help each other find the way. But keep asking the questions. But the ones that lead to God's answer. not the ones that cause us to to just remain idle. So I've heard this said about Christians. You know, Christians are are not good thinkers. They just live by blind faith. You ever heard someone say that? You know, they kind of disconnect the mind from the soul and they say, well, you know what? To believe what they believe and to live the way that they live, they've kind of just got to kind of walk blindly and not think things through. But I'm here today to tell us this, that the, the process of taking thoughts captive establishes a life in Christ that has faith and intellect. And that's possible for us because of the God that we serve. Think about this for a minute. God is smart and it doesn't interfere with his faith. You know, but if we think that, we, that walking in faith does not involve asking the right questions or having um, a, a, an intellectual process that keeps us on track with God, we are um, in a place that is not seeing us for who we have been made to be. We just have to learn how to set our thoughts on the right things. And over time, freedom in Christ changes the way that we think and the way that we live because we are called to freedom. But we are not just called to freedom, we are called to love. And here's really the motivation behind, I believe, the whole verse. Paul says, through love, serve one another. Christ establishes within us a a heart of service that that beats for love and not gain. So our motivation is to to work, to to work is, is, is of the Spirit and is not driven by what we receive or accomplish, but rather it is something that is following a process that God is unfolding in us. And that's the way biblical love works. It very much includes our decision-making power. See, the word love that that Paul is is referring to here is one that is unique to the church. It's an an agape love. And agape love is is not to be confused with liking something. And oftentimes those words are interchangeable within our society. Oftentimes we'll say something like, I love chocolate, when we really mean I like chocolate. I have some kind of an attachment to chocolate because of uh, maybe an emotional kind of response that we have to it in some way, shape, or form. If chocolate's not your thing, you just pick what is. We all have them. Our likes uh, assume an attachment, and oftentimes we substitute, we substitute our likes for the things that we are called to love. The agape love of the Bible is one that does not start with an emotion, but rather it starts with a decision. You know, that's why Jesus can tell us, love your enemies. You know, it's, it's a completely foreign concept to anyone outside of Christ. How in the world can I love my enemies? We can love them because of a choice that we make. So here's a, a definition that, that um, 
we are to embrace as we learn how to love, and then this begins to inform how and why we serve. The love of the Bible is a love that motivates our, our serving, and it begins with a decision to compassionately, righteously, sacrificially, and responsibly seek the well-being of others. We decide to make a need, and then by the grace of God, oftentimes we are able to love what we like. So I illustrated it this way in the 8 o'clock service. Um, you know, marriage has a great way of working this process out in us. And there are a lot of things that are a part of everyday life that I don't I don't like, and I didn't love. I don't particularly enjoy doing the dishes. I, I am grateful for the individual that um, invented the dishwasher. Because you know what? The process just goes a little bit faster than it used to, right? I'm probably somewhat scarred, you know, because... You know, we grew up, um, every other weekend, my sister and I went to our dad's house, and, and every Friday night when we showed up, we, 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 sh- we uh, walked into um, a kitchen that was filled with dishes that were dirty. You know, so to have a bowl for cereal on Saturday morning, and then on Friday night, you were washing the dishes, and I didn't really like that. You know, taking the garbage out, even in our home, we make you know coffee every morning. And and and, and as I was younger and a little bit less mature, I, I I just looked at those things and I ran the other way. But as I you know began to grow and to mature, I began to understand this: because I love my wife, I'm going to make a decision to do some of the things that will cause her to feel less of a burden when she walks in the door. So if I'm the first one home now, when I get home, if the garbage is full, it gets taken out. If the dishwasher needs to be filled, I'm filling it. If the coffee hasn't been made for the morning, I'm making it. And now, something that I had to to make a decision to do because I loved my wife, I do actually kind of enjoy now because I see the value and the fruit of it. And I don't think that process is all that much unlike the journey that we are on together. Because sometimes we 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 respond out of a level of decision and then we grow into the thing that God has called us to do. And that's essential for us. Because when we receive God's love, He wants it to flow through us and not stop with us. And serving is the thing that opens the spigot. So Clovis Chappelle was a pastor from a century ago, and he used to tell the story of two steamboats. They left Memphis at the same time, traveling down the Mississippi River to New Orleans, and as they traveled side by side, sailors from one vessel made a few remarks about the snail's pace of the other. Challenges were made and the race began. The competition became vicious as the two boats roared through the deep south. One boat began falling behind because it did not have enough fuel. There had been plenty of coal for the trip, but not enough for a race. And as the boat dropped behind, an enterprising young sailor took some of the ship's cargo and tossed it into the ovens. And when the sailors saw that the supplies burned as well as the coal, they fueled the boat with the material they had been assigned to transport. And they ended up winning the race, but they burned their cargo. I think life looks a lot like that race sometimes. When we say yes to to serving, we are recognizing the freedom that we have in Christ and and, and, and what he has given us to do to help others find 
you know, that freedom. And that freedom, it changes our perspective. It causes us to understand that it is not a good idea to burn the cargo for momentary gain. And the cargo that we have is this. It's the gifts and the abilities and the talents you know, that God has given you. And he wants you to use the, those gifts over the long haul, not with just this race in mind, but with the hope of bearing eternal fruit in the end. So that when we come to the place where the Lord has said, what have you done with what I entrusted you with? He is able to say, well done, good and faithful servants. But here's the thing, when the when, the, when the, the, the thoughts are not taken captive and strongholds begin to fill our lives and we begin to disqualify ourselves and listen to voices that are outside of what Christ has prescribed, we are using what he has entrusted us just to keep the boat moving forward a little bit and a little bit more. And there's an artificial significance attached to that. Because in the end, it accomplishes nothing. But as we think about how we're called to love, as a congregation, we need to say yes to allowing God's love to flow through us and not stop with us. In whatever way that looks like. And here's the deal. I am not the one defining what that looks like for you. I'm just encouraging you to have a heart that says yes to what Jesus is already going to say to you. And as a people, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna come around one another to figure that out in the days ahead. And we're going to discover this. This life isn't about finishing first. But it's about making decisions to serve others because in doing so, we follow the example of Christ. How can we do no less than what he has already done for us? So we say yes to serving because it's the moment in time that we find ourselves in. There's a fresh assignment and a new adventure awaiting us as a people. God is in it. I'm going to give you something the 8 o'clock didn't get because it, um, it just continues to add fuel to me. This is an experience I had this week. And it just reminds me of the essential nature of what is ahead and why God is moving us in the direction that he is. Tuesday night we had our board meeting and we did it over at the Reed Avenue campus. And um, we did it so that we could spend a, a dedicated season of prayer in that building and praying for the ministry that's going to come. We're praying for safety as the work begins. Provision, you know, as we continue to, to meet the challenges that are ahead. And I got there a little bit early. And as I began to take all of the stuff for a board meeting out of my truck, a neighbor of the church came through the parking lot on his bike and as he rode his bike he had the remote control for a little car in the other hand an RC car radio controlled car and he passed by me on his bike and I just said you are one talented guy and he went to the end of the parking lot and he turned around and he came back to my truck we talked about RC cars a little bit, and, and um, I said, my name is Jared. What's your name? He said, my name is Daniel. I said, Daniel, tell me your story. He 
His story started, I used to go to church. He grew up in Texas, and he uh, shared that he grew up in a Pentecostal church. And then he said, when I got of age, I ran as far away from the church as I could get. And I got in a lot of trouble. He said, but 16 years ago, I got married, and my wife moved me to Rockford. And he said, and you know what? Every day things are getting a little bit better between me and God. I said, Daniel, I believe you are going to live true to your name. In the sense that there were things that wanted to devour you, just like Daniel in the lion's den. But as you put your hope in Christ, you're going to win the day. I said, so um, I'm inviting you to our first service, Daniel. And he said, I'll be there. And I said, tell me about this Pentecostal church that you grew up in. He said, well, they were kind of out there. I said, okay, tell me more. said, well, you know, there was a box on the stage that had snakes in it. (laughs) I said, Daniel, I said, we're a Pentecostal church, and I'm the pastor, and I want you to know I would have run away as far as I could have from that too. But I said, what you're going to discover about Rock Church is this. We are a place that wants to be true to the word and alive in the spirit. True to the word in the sense that that's where we're anchored and where we're rooted. And that is, that is what we pursue. But alive in the spirit and that we just believe that what God has given is still available for today. And you know what he said, I'll be there. And then he said this, he said, do you need somebody to mow the yard? <laughs> and I, I, said, I said, Daniel, I've been thinking about that. So I'm going to mow the yard. I said, that's great. And I said, I'm going to give you a little something for that because I will not take advantage of you. And I just share this. We have got to walk out the freedom that we have in Christ. And we've got to love according to the example that he's given us because of the Daniels. His world is being redefined. And you know what? He's going to come back full circle. And he's going to walk with Jesus again. So here's the deal. I've met Kevin, DJ, and Daniel. And had the same kind of conversation with all three of them. And when we say yes to serving, we're not just saying yes to busyness or more to do, but we're saying yes to the reason why God has put us on the face of this earth. And I just want to make this plea. Can, will you allow us to figure it out together? Let's do this together. Let's just recognize that some things are shifting. There might even be some shifting that needs to happen in some of us. But if Christ is in it, it will be an adventure. Would you stand with me? Let's bow our heads right now just in a spirit of prayer. And um, I've done a lot of talking and you've done a lot of listening. So let's just turn our ears to the Lord right now and 
I think we do that by just saying, you know what, Lord, you, you have my heart, you have my life. And maybe that's where this process starts. It's just reaffirming. that You belong to him. And then we just take the next step and just saying, you know, Lord, I, I want to enter into what you have, but I need your help. And would you just kind of make that the cry of your heart right now? It might look similar to things that have been going on. It might be something new. But Lord, just say, just say yes to the Lord. And ask him for his help. pray that there would you know be perhaps even some thoughts that are just removed from our hearts and minds right now Lord thoughts of being disqualified thoughts of having nothing to give or offer back to you but I know sometimes our our thoughts are very much influenced by hurts and disappointments and hang-ups and maybe even insecurities. And Lord, we just declare right now Jesus to be Lord. And we pray, Lord, that there would just be um, a clear path in these days ahead. And let a conversation begin today that just carries on within us the days, the weeks, the months ahead. So as we're all just listening and fixing our eyes on uh, Christ and what he's calling us to, maybe Christ is calling you today to make him Lord and Savior. Every head bowed and every eye closed, you're here today and you say, you know what, I, I need to know Christ as my Lord and Savior. I know the forgiveness of my sins. and I want to make a commitment to, to follow him from this day forward. If that's you, we want to just pray a prayer together that establishes that decision and begins that journey. So could you, would you just let us know who you are by showing us your hand today so we can pray that prayer in the one at all. Today is the day I need to make Christ my Lord and Savior. I'll just give you a moment. And when you got things that you need to talk through as you find your way back to Him, just don't leave here today without having that conversation. And Lord, we thank you for today. Father, we just pray that as we leave here, Lord, may we go in your grace and in your peace. I pray that you would watch over us, you would keep us. I pray you'd bring us back again soon. And Father, we just pray that the time together in the gym as we leave here, Lord, let it just be a tool that shepherds us, that leads us, and may it be uh, beneficial, Lord, as we um, determine, Lord, where you have called us to fit. And we thank you for it now, in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you for joining us on our live stream today. Our hope is that you will discover life in Christ. If you have a prayer need, please take time to fill out a connection card from our website, or you may also send an email to prayer at rockchurch.net 
and one of our pastors will follow up with you as soon as possible. For more information about our church, please visit our website at rockchurch.net. We hope to see you in person for one of our live services on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. God bless you today.